everyone. Um, welcome. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Andrew, for inviting me. Uh, this is my first time at Art Directors Bootcamp, and it's been six years since I talked to GDC, so I might be a little bit rusty. Um, thank you all for showing up. This is quite an audience. I don't remember I've ever seen a room this full when we did Killzone. Uh, so let's full, first do full introductions. My name is Jan Bart van Beek. I am the studio art director and animation art director at Guerrilla Games. And uh, as you may know, Guerrilla Games is part of Sony Worldwide Studios. So that's a group of 14 very, very different game developers from Naughty Dog, Guerrilla, Media Molecule, Polyphony, uh, that all work together to make the first party portfolio of Sony. Now, we ourselves are Guerrilla. Uh, we're based in Amsterdam, lovely city. Uh, and as you may know, uh, the last title that we did was Horizon Zero Dawn, which was also our first open world action role playing game. Uh, so just to get an idea, who has played Horizon? Very good. Who has finished Horizon? <laughs> who has platinumed Horizon? Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Glad to see that our lead designer has a platinum. So before we start, let's start with a, a reminder of what Horizon is. Uh, and here's our E3 trailer from 2016. We know we weren't the first ones here. Our stories speak of the ones that came before. The old ones. The world of the old ones was so different than ours. They had built incredible cities with towers that reached the stars. But a darkness came, and their cities turned to graves. And without them, the land started to change. Their great cities faded away. And in their place came new life. Over time, one by one, the tribes came to these lands. Some small and humble, some powerful as kings. They say my tribe was the first. The first to hunt. The first to raise our bows. For this world was never ours. We've always shared it. A dangerous balance between man and machine. It goes on and on and on. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the art direction of Horizon, but before we go there, I want to talk about the idea behind Horizon. Uh, we get this question a lot. Where does the, where's the origins of the idea? Where does this idea of a young girl hunting robot dinosaurs in a post-apocalyptic post world come from? Uh, and that all started in 2010, when our studio asked us, the development staff, to pitch ideas for a new game. Before that time, we had worked on Killzone for almost a decade. And Killzone, for those who know, is a first-person shooter that is set in a dark and dystopian future. And while Killzone had been moderately successful, it never really was a great hit. So after about six of these titles, we needed to reconsider. Uh, is this really the best way to use our development team's time, talent, and effort? Uh, now, some of you may have heard of the term franchise fatigue. So unlike movie franchises, Games tend to get better with their sequels. 
Um, and that is basically because over time and over multiple titles, a development teams really gets much better. They get better at understanding the technology, they get better at understanding each other, and they get better at understanding what makes their particular game tick. So unless your company has a very high turnover in staff, it's usually the case that the same people, the same team, work on sequel after sequel. Uh, sometimes, as in our case, basically more than a decade. And then at some time, time point, the, that team gets tired of overworking it. Uh, although your knowledge and the team synergy and the skill sets are all at peak performance, the results are sort of diminishing. Uh, so, and basically, sorry, after all, basically, how many different games can you make about a bunch of space Nazis with red glowing eyes? So let's reboot completely. Let's start from scratch. Let's take all of our learnings, let's, the, the learnings of my first IP, and see basically what we can do basically when we all start from scratch. So first, let me tell you a little bit about Sony in itself. Uh, Sony is, has quite a unique structure. It's fundamentally bottom up. So Sony doesn't really tell the studios what kind of games they make. Uh, they let that, that, that figure out themselves. Of course, there's a little bit of typecasting going on, like Naughty Dog tends to basically make action shooters, and Goya used to make first-person shooters. Polyphony makes racing games. The God of War team makes God of War. Um, and so, Becky, figuring out Becky, what we're going to make, Becky, is really up to us. And in Guerrilla's case, we apply that structure all the way down to the core of our process. So we go to our own development staff and ask them what kinds of games they would like to make. Um, but before you try this at home, it's probably good to understand that this level of creative freedom often needs a lot of guidance to be successful. I'm not sure basically how many of you are familiar with this diagram. It's the double diamond design process. Uh, it gets used a lot in complicated processes like surface design. Um, and to be honest, Becky, we didn't actually know that this was a thing until we had made the game, and then we heard about it, and it was sort of like, oh, that's kind of what we did. Uh, so in hindsight, we did this instinctively, but it makes a lot of sense. So if you think about it, Becky, the pitch process that I'm about to describe is this discover phase, and you want to go as wide as possible with the ideas that you gather. And then as you go forward, you go narrow again, as you try to define the core of a game, and then you go sort of broad again, wide again. It's sort of this cycle of adding new ideas and then subtracting the bad ideas. Um, but even in the discover phase, you need to have some sort of direction because you need to go somewhere. Uh, otherwise, you just get this explosion of creativity, and then it's really hard to get sort of define it down again to what the focus is of something. So I'm going to describe a little bit, Becky, how we focused our creativity. We put together this brief that went to everybody in the entire company with a very specific mission. Develop an epic and cinematic character-driven game universe with intense action-packed gameplay, strong storytelling set in a distinct and rich universe. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, so it's a really, really big statement. Uh, and it's actually pretty open. What it mostly says is don't come up with a mobile puzzle game. Um, and because we have all this creative autonomy as a studio, we felt an enormous responsibility to do this right, not just creatively, but also strategically and commercially. So the, the nine-page briefing that we sent out basically included a whole broad range of topics. Um, we didn't exclude any genre, but there were a couple of considerations that people needed to take. First of all, Beggy, you know, Think about this from Sony's perspective, Peggy, what is missing in their portfolio? And of course, Peggy, one thing that was missing was RPG and action RPG. Uh, and there were other considerations, like, OK, you know, we're, we're good at some things. We have really good tech. We have good experience making with combat mechanics. We're good at making pretty art. Uh, we have maybe a very good team of concept artists and a very good design team as well. But, you know, what can we do, maybe, with all these things that we've learned doing Killzone and come up with something, maybe, that uses or that leverages that knowledge without, maybe, just doing the same thing over and over again? And, of course, maybe, we discuss other things as well, like, you know, market saturations, certain trends that were appearing, uh, a whole bunch of different things that people could take into the consideration. But mostly we asked them to think really big. Uh, the ambition for this new concept was to create a world that would be rich enough to explore in not just a series of games, but potentially also books and movies and onwards. Make you really think about franchise building instead of making just a single game idea. Uh, in total, we received about 30 to 40 pitches. Uh, this is just a very small sample of what we could still find. Um, and so what was kind of odd is basically that we didn't really specifically ask them to come up with ideas that were as opposite as possible from Killzone, but it's more something that sort of naturally came out of the process. 
And many of the pitches that we got basically hit on recurring notes. There were certain themes that we all gravitated towards. Uh, so very clearly we were done with dystopian worlds full of glass and steel and concrete and bullets. Uh, and instead we wanted to build very lush and very rich worlds. I guess basically sort of like that's what franchise fatigue does. You can sort of want to make the other thing. Uh, but thankfully, we weren't really done with robots and mechs. Basically, we love that. Basically, we love a healthy dose of cool science fiction machines. But mostly, we wanted to create something basically that was very unique, something that has a pos positive tone to it, something that felt very fresh, something that would be eye-catching, evocative, and mostly something that would stand out in the marketplace. And Horizon clearly stood out from all the different concepts that were pitched. It was by far the favorite pitch among our own staff, and also basically when we showed the con I mean, a couple of concepts to our colleagues at Sony, everybody said, like, make this one. Basically, it's sort of, it's weird, and you're probably gonna fail, but, you know, it's, it's at least something new. <laughs> uh, so, what was it about Horizon that drew people in? Now, to some degree, we're still trying to figure that out, but we've got a couple of ideas. Um, First of all, it had a lot of very contrasting elements, lots of juxtapositions that created intrigue and tension. tension. So let's take a look at some of Horizon's many themes. Uh, first of all, it is a world where the flow of time appears to have been reversed. Uh, we've got a primitive age that has come after an age of high technology. And it's a world where the world of science has become the world of mythology and magic. And it's a world that questions the definition of life as we know it, where the artificial has become the natural. Now, usually going for high concept science fiction is a very, very hard sell. Uh, but thankfully, we got some help from James Cameron. In 2009, Avatar came out, and it showed the whole world that the audience are still interested in, in very high concept science fiction. But in order to succeed, it needs to deliver something new and fresh. Now, Avatar, although it's a science fiction movie, it's actually a back-to-nature story. It's about a space-faring civilization that clashes with the tribal inhabitants of a, of a far-away world. And uh, it's a world where they celebrate this. They celebrate the magic of nature. So it's science fiction, but it's very relatable, and it's also very relevant. It asks a couple of important questions, like whether technology and nature are opposing forces. In the years before Avatar, there was a, a sort of resurgence in the appreciation of the natural world. You may remember the Planet Earth series, the, the ones about the oceans, a whole bunch of these very lush, beautifully made documentaries. Uh, and ironically, it was actually new technologies and film technology that made these things possible. So we saw this, this aspect of new technology actually heightening the natural experience instead of fighting it. Then basically on the other side became sort of aware of the flip side of technological advances. The notion that if you push nature too far, it might just basically push back. Uh, and this created a sort of new type of apocalyptic end of the world scenario. So there are a couple of uh, apocalyptic scenarios that have existed for very long. You've got this, the very old one from the 50s and the 60s, like the alien invasion or the nuclear war or the zombies. Uh, and then sometimes basically, new things come into fashion because of new societal fears. So now we have movies about global environmental collapse or the rise of the machines uh, or smart monkeys. Um, in any case, there are many different types of e stories that describe the events of apocalypse. They all focus on showing the events that are preceding it or during the apocalypse. And to some degree, most of them are actually disaster movies. And then when we get to the post-apocalypse, we suddenly see this enormous loss of conceptual variety. What we pretty much end up with is wastelands with lots of bad people. They tend to be dark, decrepit worlds, filled with constant danger, and most commonly, actually, the biggest danger is other people, because other people are bad. Um, and so it's all about trying to survive in these harsh worlds. Uh, this, this sort of end of the world scenario, it has certainly fascinated storytellers and audience alike for a very long time, but these worlds, these, these, these are depicted, they've become very overly familiar to our audiences. And Horizon promised sort of like a different view on that, a different view on the apocalypse. So it's a common notion that the end of mankind is automatically the end of the world. Uh, and of course, basically the reality is that that's very far from the truth. Our planet has survived something like six total near extinctions of all life, and life tends to come back every single time. It's, it's the Michael Crichton thing, life finds a way. Uh, and so Horizon promised a new sort of escape from the dreariness of the post-apocalypse. 
Basically, we started describing it as the post-poke apocalypse, uh, and maybe there's even a post-post-post apocalypse. Um, so it's a new type of world. It's not a dystopian one, it's not a utopian world either, uh, but it's one that sort of blossomed on the ashes of our world, to, call it, to say it very prosaic. Uh, it's a world that isn't really concerned with the past anymore. Uh, the apocalypse in Horizon has become the stuff of myths. It, those dark days are over and life has moved on. So in some degree, Horizon opens, offers like a hopeful view of the end of civilization. One that's not about morbid display of death, but one that highlights a sort of new and brighter world that comes after all that death. And within fiction, there aren't many stories that really explore the world that comes after. Uh, and creatively, that helps to some degree, uh, as the audience doesn't have a lot of expectations about these worlds. So it allows you to be a little bit bolder and, and use surprise and intrigue to you know, interest the audience with something new and unfamiliar. Um, but the stories that do exist, they often add a very fascinating ingredient to the post-apocalyptic mix, and that's mystery. Almost in every one of these, basically, there is a detective story going on. It's the question of what happened, uh, who done it. Uh, and those setups are usually very intellectually compelling to an audience. They get to mentally explore this world. Uh, they get to mentally explore something that's unknown and mysterious to them. And in that regard, it's, it's a real proper adventure. But it's also harder, especially from an art directional point of view, to make that believable. Uh, if it intrigues the audience, but it doesn't make sense to them, they're not gonna keep engaged in your fantasy for very long. Uh, and that's the ultimate trick of production design that production designers to pull off, to create a world with a sense of authenticity and believability. Now in our visual design process, we generally avoid rushing towards an end visual. Uh, instead, we take a lot of time to really research every element that's part of the sum uh, that makes up the final piece of key art. So we don't just throw everything together at the same time, but we very slowly layer the elements carefully together. A key inspiration in our process was Alan Weissman's book, The World Without Us. Uh, who has read this book? Very few people, thankfully. That's, that's why we got to make Horizon. Uh, so in this book, he describes a scenario where suddenly all humans have disappeared from Earth. Uh, and he doesn't really explain why, because that's not really that important. But one of the things that he does in the book is that he very carefully describes the process of how all traces of mankind, all evidence of mankind over the ages will finally disappear. Uh, and there's this nice little moment at the end of the book where he describes basically the last thing basically, that will remain of humanity. Who can guess? No, it's, uh, it's the Voyager. Because basically, when our sun finally goes supernova, this thing is literally in another galaxy. Um, so we started to recreate that process. Uh, we took a typical American Midwestern town, because why not, and started to visualize what would happen to that. So in Horizon's background story, the apocalypse dissolved oil biomatter, so it's a completely lifeless desert, and all the soil has turned to sand. Uh, so we started studying what would happen to buildings, to villages, to cities, in these type of desert environments. And of course, you'll see some really typical patterns. Uh, roofs start to collapse, then the walls, and then the fa facades basically collapse. But sometimes arches and columns stay around, that's why we still see them in some of the ancient ruins. Uh, and chimneys, for some reason, chimneys stay up forever. Uh, thousands of years even, really, the, the landscapes are littered with them. Um, and then so also because there's no fiber in the ground anymore, there's no roots anymore, maybe the soil itself starts to move like a liquid. It becomes sand dunes, it starts to move around. So it starts to flow around buildings, cover them as the wind pushes it. And these shifting sands uh, affect the ruins, of course. Maybe they push the ruins, they fill the ruins, they, they change everything about the landscape till it's been completely changed. And then we started imagining maybe how life would, would return. Maybe it would probably first jump, spring up in places where the soil can hold water in the moment maybe that rains come back. And then uh, life starts to spread everywhere. And then you'll add, end up with something like this, where it, it's very much buried and overgrown at the same time. And this is the sort of key of making it look like a thousand years instead of like, like 50 years after the apocalypse. The whole notion maybe that the landscape itself would have vastly changed. 
And then we took it a little bit further, uh, hundreds of years further. So at some point, you've got skyscrapers that start to crumble and they become hills again because of the, the alluvial lines around them. And rivers, of course, change course and start to cut new canyons through the structure. And the whole landscape becomes unrecognizable, but very old feeling at the same time. The following movie that I'm about to show is the first art benchmark that we created. So this was back in 2014. Gilbert Becky was one of the artists working on it, one of the two artists working on this. Uh, so this is about one year into production and about two and a half years before we go to release. So if you're interested in how we made this, Shilber will be talking, doing a talk on Friday. Yes. Uh, so this is my plug for his talk. Um, so the final combined results of all these elements is one of Horizon's three conceptual pillars. And I'll explain a little bit, Becky, what we mean with the pillars. So at Guerrilla, we use a game design process that we call the pillar mythology. Uh, the game pillars are a set of key statements about the intended experience, and it takes quite a bit of time to craft these pillars, as all the wording of it is carefully tuned until all the pillars stay exactly what the creative intent is. So there shouldn't be one word too many, there must no word too less. Every single word making that's in there is there for a reason. And so Horizon's environment with its wilderness and its overgrown ruins is one of these pillars, uh, and the other two pillars are about tribal culture and the machines. And of course, Becky, the fourth implicit one, Becky, that is Aloy. So remember the double diamond? Uh, these pillars sit at the midpoint of the double diamond. It's the smallest, most compact way of describing the core experience of the game. The pillar statement that we have of, of the tribes was the one on screen here, and as you can see, it's quite a mouthful. Uh, but one of the key observations that we from the Art Directional team Baker, took out of it uh, that is that it's, it talks in plural, pluralities. <laughs> Sorry about that, not my native language. Uh, so, it talks about cultures and stories and characters. It's really about volume. So our job wasn't just to design one rich tribal culture, but actually a whole range of them. Um, and the pillar doesn't just have subtext about volume. It also implies diversity. It implies distinction and believability. And especially belie believability can be very challenging. Now, the process that we use to achieve believability is something that we call intrinsic ideation, because we love pretentious terms. Uh, now, some of you may have heard about the rule of cool. 
the rule of cool states that things are always cooler if you just keep adding other cool stuff on top of your cool idea stuff. Uh, and the problem, of course, with this is basically that it completely destroys the believability of any idea as you keep adding and adding more mismatched ideas to it. Now, I already see you guys thinking, Becky, aren't you the guys that added robot dinosaurs to a game? So I'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, intrinsic idea does, ideation doesn't allow you to just add cool stuff to it. Everything you design has to be there for a reason. Uh, and there has to be a reason why it looks the way that it looks. So before we started designing the tribal cultures, our first question was, how does culture develop in the real world? So we studied a lot of theories, and actually, maybe John, our narrative director, says maybe that we're probably the, uh, the group of people with the highest density of reading guns, nerves, of steel in the world that he knows. Um, and maybe anthropologists maybe don't agree on everything, but they do agree on a couple of things. And one of the common th things that they do agree in, on is that culture is all about resources. So the resources that an environment provides, that's what defines a culture. So let's take a look at one of the tribal cultures in Horizon, uh, the Nora tribe. So this is a tribe that lives in the Rocky Mountains. And so we can so, sort of say, well, okay, what does the environment tell us about this tribe? So for one, uh, mountain terrain isn't really suited for agriculture. So without farming, food will have to come from hunting. Uh, so most likely we're looking at a hunting gathering lifestyle. And without agriculture, there's also a limit on how large a tribe can become because there's no real way of creating surplus food and storing it. Uh, so also making in smaller tribes, people tend to do everything. Maybe there isn't really space for people to specialize in tailors or carpenters or tradesmen or video game developers. Um, so maybe it sort of limits maybe the variety of professions that you see there and maybe what that means for the things and the tools that you see as well. And then, of course, maybe there are high mountain passes, uh, and that makes trade much higher. So you can expect to see maybe that these people are, tend to be quite self-reliant and also a little bit weary of stranger. Uh, actually, sort of what you see with a lot of people maybe that have grown up into mountains, they tend to be a little bit weird. <laughs> now, also in our background story, uh, a couple of important narrative as well as game design decisions were made. And for one, Baker, there was, a reason, there was a clear statement that there weren't any large animals anymore. So there weren't any cows, there weren't any, any horses, there weren't any bears or mountain lions. Uh, so our art designers started from there. What do these limitations mean for, for example, clothing? Uh, because that means, Baker, that you only have small heights, you only have rabbits and you have foxes, all kind of tiny patches. So that basically means that all your clothing needs to be compiled out of these smarter, smaller things and you end up with very rich patchworks. Uh, and also we figured maybe they won't have cotton. Cotton is actually quite hard to grow, but they might have wool. Uh, so maybe you know, they would have to do something with wild mountain goats. Uh, and although weaving might be too complex because that requires very complex equipment, uh, they would still be able to braid and knit things together. Uh, and so we also figured maybe that if, if they were able to do braiding and knitting, they would be able to make rope. Uh, and so let's, figure, let's see maybe how important rope can be for them. Because it's an important thing that you need in hunting. You need it for traps and bows and fish snatch and all kinds of hunting gear. So I'm going to guess maybe these people are very, quite good at using rope and making stuff with rope. Uh, and then basically from that, it's, it's sort of imaginable that they could use rope in all kinds of other key elements in their construction techniques. So it would be a way maybe, that they would put larger wooden structures together uh, and even maybe extend that to architecture. Of course, maybe architecture itself, maybe there's a lot of trees in the mountains or some mountains. Uh, so that, again, maybe informs maybe what they would be building from. They wouldn't basically be making things out of mud or stone. They would be using the most pliable material that they can find around. So as you can see, maybe we're sort of layering these elements on top of each other in a logical structure. Everything is there for a reason. Now, as this process of ideation continues, you start to get the outline lines of a culture. Uh, but the problem is, in our earliest things, maybe that things starts to look very mundane. Uh, maybe an image like this, this would just as easily fit in the world of Lord of the Rings or in Game of Thrones. But there is, of course, maybe one truly unique element in the world of Horizon. Uh, and that is sure to have a very large impact on the development of all cultures. And that's the presence of these giant animal-like machines. Um, so, for example, maybe what effect would it have on clothing? Uh, now, in some degree, maybe these metal plates are sort of like bones, and bones are actually quite 
bad for making armor with because they break and they're quite brittle. But what would happen, Beggy, if you use, start using these armor plates in our clothing, Beggy, would that make sense? So we started experimenting, basically, with this look, basically, where the metal parts would be embedded in their clothing, uh, and that actually, basically, started to make sense, basically. This, this would actually be a feasible idea for them. Uh, and so we could begin experimenting with ways to include them in all their hunting gears, looking at how these elements would mix uh, and how they would connect to the existing elements that are already there. And then, of course, basically, there's tons of variation and there's tons of balancing, basically, you know, how go a little bit too far, you end up with a science fiction game. If it's not there at all, basically it's barely noticeable and it doesn't really have any big impact. So over time, we managed to basically get this sort of final result that we felt basically was both authentic to the culture, but also created a distinct look for the world of Horizon. Now, so through this technique of intrinsic ideation, we managed to create quite a wide variety of different cultures. Cultures that were all very distinct from each other and it all fitted with the environments of the tribes and it gave Horizon a very unique and visual identity. So the next thing that I'm going to show is one of our trailers where we show a little bit more of the tribes. Your whole life you've been searching and the elders, they've been holding you back. The girl is a curse. She came from nowhere. She is no one. When they told me to raise you, I didn't ask questions. Why am I an outcast? Who was my mother? Always you pushed for answers. Push yourself to the edge. Outcasts, but it's safe. Out there, girl, you'll be lost. You won't know where to turn or who to trust. You'll be chasing a riddle into a wilderness of mysteries. The world of the old ones. What secrets? lie buried beneath their crumbling ruins. Why Earth is ours no more. These questions, Aloy, the tribe has forbidden. What if the answers are worse than not knowing? You can help, or you can get out of my way. Then be ready for the darkness. And be careful of what you bring to light. Even if you do catch what you're after, how do you know it won't? Bite back. Outcast! You came from nothing. You will die a nothing. I came from somewhere. Identity confirmed. Even if it destroys me, I will see this through. Okay, let's get back to the robot dinosaurs. <laughs> uh, so when we started the design of our machines, uh, our inspiration started with the types of machines that we had designed for Killzone. Military, industrial design, clearly machines that were designed for war and destruction. Something that would be very alien, something unnatural, sort of like monsters of war. And we played around with the idea of making them half broken. They're a thousand years old, so rom robot zombie monsters. Uh, playing with things like strange way of, mo of movement and locomotion, so sort of like nightmare creatures. Now, um, we were still using a version of intrinsic ideation, and one of the things that we tried to emulate was how military design firms work uh, when they approach a design challenge like this. So we even role-played that a little bit, that process of making the type of commercials that you typically see with military contractors and what they would produce. 
So usually they tend to be very sort of gung-ho, look at our cool system thing. Uh, so here's Becky, one of the movies, Becky, that our team made, Becky, to sort of sell their initial idea of Becky, what the robots could look like. When you invest in a GDLS vehicle, you know your investment is a sound one. And that investment extends well past the date your vehicle is delivered because you have the assurance that through life support, one of the premier product support programs in the industry is behind you. A program you won't find anywhere else because keeping you mission ready is what GDLS customer support is all about. I think this, did this inspire our narrative team a little bit, Becky, about Faro Industries? Uh, but the thing is, Becky, that this, this, this didn't work at all. Um, we made some of these prototypes, and what we found, Becky, was that the emotional core experience was just completely off. Um, so when we look back at one of the pillars, it, it told us something really important about the core experience, and that it was about hunting. Uh, and fighting against these sort of robot monster zombies machines, it didn't make you feel like a fight, like a hunter. It made you feel like a warrior, like a soldier fighting in the world of Terminator. And also, it clashed with another pillar that we have. Uh, the designs failed to come across as something that was a life form. Uh, in fact, they came across as solar soulless machines. So the, we decided to scrap everything and start from scratch. So we needed a design for the machines that enabled our players to feel like hunted, like hunters. And at the same time, maybe that they needed to feel alive and they needed to feel dominating. So maybe it was time to look back at another point in time where there was actually another dominant life form. Uh, and sure, maybe when somebody suggested, let's turn all the machines into di dinosaurs, a lot of people got very, very worried. Um, <laughs> because this is sort of like the rule of cool, right? This is, the, this is a problem. It's, it's Vikings hunting robot dinosaurs. It's completely ridiculous. Uh, but still, sort of reductantly, Becky, we decided to try it out and just see, Becky, what it would look like and feel like from a concept art point of view. Uh, and then, Becky, as that happened, something started to happen. None of these things made intellectually any sense, uh, but the imagery, Becky, that we created worked emotionally. This, this whole silly idea of a primitive mankind hunting high-tech megafauna just clicked. And everybody got very inspired, and it just tapped this, this treasure trove of ideas. It really perfectly encapsulated this feeling of being a hunter of very dangerous prey. Uh, by using familiar shapes, such as the famous T-Rex, everybody immediately understood their relationship to it. If something, if something really big and dangerous stands in front of you, Becky, you understand that it's dangerous. Becky, you don't need to explain it through complex animations or backstories. So it might have created some level of intellectual confusion, but the emotional clarity was there. Uh, it was sort of like an, under, an extra interesting juxtaposition. Um, now, there was a lot of concern about the ideas of robot animals. Uh, maybe it was a little bit too strange, a little bit too alienating for our audience to accept. Uh, and thankfully, real life has some precedent in this whole notion, this idea. So these are, of course, making the famous movies from Boston Dynamics uh, that make these robot dogs. They also always kick them. <laughs> so if you're ever wondering, Becky, why the robot apocalypse happened, it's because of this guy. <laughs> um, so there's this movement, or they're making this philosophy in industrial design, which they call biomimetic design. And it's an industrial design philosophy that carefully looks at nature to solve certain engineering issues. So the, the notion behind this philosophy is that if you have millions and millions and millions of years of evolution, the, the solutions that tend to be, come out of that are very highly efficient solutions. A famous example of this biomimetic design is a problem Becky, that Japanese engineers had when they tried to solve the famous bullet trains. Now, when they first made these things, they would Becky, sort of send them into tunnels, and the moment Becky, that they hit the tunnel, there would be these air pressure events which literally ripped the whole train apart. And that's bad for passengers. Um, <laughs> So they, they were looking for a solution, and they got their inspiration from the, the, the beak shape of the kingfisher, because this is a bird, Becky, that once it hits the water to catch a fish, it almost makes no splash. So Becky, this is a perfect sort of evolution, Becky, that created the shape, Becky, that, that the, the high, most efficient form of hydrodynamics. And once they sort of took that shape and put it on top of these trains, the trains didn't fall apart, and Becky, people were happy. 
Uh, there's other versions of biomimetic designs as well. Uh, maybe on your flight in, you look, took a look out of the window and you saw basically these strange ailerons on the tips of airplane flames. Well, this is sort of where they come from, Maggie. It's, it's something, Maggie, that Birds of Prey has as well because it reduces drag, uh, because it does something strange with the turbulence. Um, so when we were designing with the tribes, we talked to a lot of anthropologists, and we figured it might be interesting to talk to engineers, uh, engineers who, who are working in, robot, in robotics. So we went to the Technical University in Delft, which is local to us, um, and not only did they confirm, maybe, that indeed biomimetics is a large, large part of modern robotics, but they were also using algorithms that mimic this process of evolutionary design itself. So they would create a design and then have it cross it with successful versions of itself till it would converge to the most efficient designs. And you get some really interesting things out of it because they look very oddly organic. So it's not really art imitating life, it's art imitating technology that's imitating life. Um, so it seems very logical for that our very advanced robots would sort of converge to the shapes that we see in nature as well. If you think about it, if wheels could have evolved in nature, but only if roads would have been a natural occurring feature as well. Uh, but in a world, basically, where you only have mountains and tree stumps lying around, it makes a lot more sense, basically, to have legs. Uh, we also, basically, asked them if nature could be improved upon. Uh, if, are there any sort of design mistakes or evolutionary processes, basically, that didn't go to the most optimal form? Are there any suboptimal solutions in nature? Uh, and they explained, basically, that internal skeletons is one, if you think about it. So all the soft tissue is on the outside, and then your hardest part is on the inside. It doesn't really make a lot of sense because it's just too fragile. And also, if you break one arm, maybe that, that's done. Maybe in nature, that's probably not pretty much game over. You're dead. Uh, so why put all this soft, vulnerable tissue on the outside and then create this, these sort of single points of failure? You know, is there a better solution for that? And yes, nature has better solutions for that. Uh, so exoskeletons basically are much more sturdier. You have the protective aspects on the outside. It's just, you know, if humans would look like this, basically, it would be a lot less attractive to each other, I guess. Um, and so we started to use these concepts of biomimetics, uh, artificial pneumatic muscles, uh, algorithmically generated reinforcements and exoskeletons, and started exploring a look that would make these machines believable. But it's not just about the efficiency of the biomechanics that influence the shapes of living things. Uh, uh, often, a creature's niche in an ecosystem is also what drives these evolutionary processes that adopt certain shapes and behaviors. And we wanted to show a, lot of, a large variety of different machines, each with clear and distinct shapes and behaviors that were coherent to the function that they would have in our ecosystem and in our game. So uh, one of the first ones that we tried to design were the watchers, uh, and they would be the guard dogs of our ecosystem. This was a sort of class of machine that would function as walking alarm bells in terms of the game design. Uh, and one of the things that we found out is that we could actually change the shape of these creatures quite a lot and still basically communicate what they were to do. Basically, they didn't literally need to be dogs or meerkats to basically sort of communicate their function. So one of our designers proposed this idea of making a snake on legs. Uh, so it would be able to run really fast on two legs, but then maybe if it needed to look, maybe it could just maybe sort of slide up its tail and look above things. Uh, so yeah, a, a snake that's able to stand on the tip of its tail. Now the key thing to get this to work, because it would be not really a known creature, would be to get the behavior right. Because if we got that right, we figured that the audience might be able to understand them and see them as something beyond a machine. So we see them as something like a living creature. Now here's a movie that I have, Beggy, that shows a little bit, Beggy, about our first prototype and actually the first animated robot that we had in the game. So this is almost six years old, six years ago, uh, and it shows the first watchers that we had. And Beggy, when we had this, Beggy, we knew that we could make any game that we, any robot that we had. Oh, is this, is, it's not playing. And yes, Horizon was co-op at some point. So this proved to us that this was the way forward. Uh, not only did our robots feel alive, but you could even empathize with them. You could understand their behavior. Uh, you could sort of 
by, by the way that they communicate it, you could anticipate what they want, what, what they were for, uh, and also making it made you feel like a hunter. You were studying these things. Uh, you could understand your, study your prey and understand it. So that sort of made the decision for us. Uh, so we were thankfully able to, able to rationalize our intellectual disbelief away and align it with the emotional clarity that we felt when we first started thinking about robot dinosaurs. So our cognitive dissonance was resolved and the crisis was averted. Uh, and that was time to make it codify that into the DNA of Horizon. So at that point it became about animalistic machines. Uh, let's take another look at a movie, Becky, that shows these things a little bit more from the perspective of the game. The stories don't tell where the old ones went. They don't tell us why the machines rule these lands. But they warn us that this balance cannot last. The storm is coming. And I will be ready. So a quick pro tip, if you're ever making a three minute long trailer against an unscripted AI creature, take your time. This took us about 160 takes to get it right. <laughs> uh, so arguably, we could now design any machine that we wanted, uh, but we still felt it would be better to stay with existing or extinct creatures. 
We felt basically that it gives a way to player, the player to anticipate the machine's behavior a little bit more. Because if it looks like a giant T-Rex, it's probably going to act like a giant T-Rex. Um, so, for example, we designed our version of a terror bird. This is a bird that lived about 10,000 years ago in South America, and it hunted horses. How cool is that? Um, so we had our visual style defined, and it actually is now quite easy to come up with what the look of a machine would be. But it's often unclear on how it would move, and it would be even harder to imagine basically how it would attack. So for example, how would a terror bird attack? Uh, you would figure basically like, oh, it has a giant beak, so it probably uses its beak. Um, now there is this aspect from paleontology where they tend to study sort of contemporary relative of extinct creatures and then theorize their behaviors of it. So roosters are sort of like contemporary mini-me versions of terror birds, and they do this when they attack. <laughs> They're actually quite nasty. So you see how they sort of wait for you, for you, for you to turn and then they attacking you in the butt. <laughs> so this inspired our game designers and animator to try something very familiar. And so this is the attack bacon that ended up in the game, sort of nature inspiring the attack sets in our game. And then ultimately this is how it ends up in the game. Um, so ultimately, this design process enabled us to create a very large variety of very interesting and evocative creature designs, uh, covering everything from dinosaurs and other extinct creatures to bisons, wolves, and giant birds. So the last thing that I'm going to show today, and before we go to the Q&A, uh, is one of our last trailers. This one was specific, specifically created to, to communicate the concept of being a hunter, and it shows off a lot of our machines in action. Let me tell you what's out there. Vast reaches of wilderness, untamed. A rugged domain, majestic, but lethal. It belongs to them, the machines. The steel beasts who rule these lands and guard the secrets buried beneath its crumbling ruins. If you hunt these wilds, no matter how skilled you are, no matter how clever, you will become the hunted. Can you brave that challenge? Can you pass that test? If you want to survive, you have to make the kill. Only then can you bring to light the deep secrets of the Earth. And thank you very much. Anybody has any questions? Uh, I think please step up to the microphone. I've got a question. Actually, Hello. Hi. Um, as you're searching for new IP stuff, um, you, it looks like you had tens and tens of ideas up there. What was the morale of the team like while you're kind of wandering through the desert, sort of away from the safety of this known IP that you guys have done for 10 years? Uh, in general, everybody was really excited. It's, it's, you know, it's a once-in-a-decade opportunity to you know, start at the, at, the, at the birth of a new IP. Uh, so a lot of people basically, were very interested in, in taking part of that. And of course, basically, people get disappointed if their idea doesn't get picked. Pick, so that's certainly a thing there. But in general, basically, it's, it's actually really good for morale. Hi. Uh, great presentation. Um, so my question is like whenever someone like pitches the ideas, let's say you guys had 25 different ideas, uh, I know it's a like there's hierarchy in the studio, there's level of like you know um, expert ex ex like how expert you are in your craft. But my question is like whenever someone pitches it, how much are they in creative control throughout the like whole process, or is it just the pitching idea and then it's the regular team? So yeah, you know people that 
pitch Peggy stay involved as stakeholders within it. Uh, but of course, Becky, if you have you know, a, a junior programmer Becky, pitching a great idea, it doesn't necessarily mean that he has the skill sets to also Becky, be the game director on the entire process because that requires different skills. So usually when, when this happens, people pitch the idea, but then Becky, it gets taken over by the entire team and there is more of a clear structure in place. Okay. Well, hello. Uh, it was a very interesting and in-depth presentation. So it was really, really awesome, like to learn how, like how kind of like life itself influences into the designs, into the futuristic and into this juxtaposition of futuristic plus and minimalistic aesthetics. So I think that's really awesome. And my question was more about like the design pillars that the, that the team uses in, in Guerrilla. Like, do these design pillars are always changing, or do they stay practically the, like the like the same in almost all the development of the, of the aesthetic of the game. So, so the theory is, Peggy, or the idealistic presentation, Peggy, that the pillars never change. Mm -hmm. Of course, Peggy, they do s slightly get tuned over time to make it fit better. But there are sort of, Peggy, there are design bibles. So preferably we don't like to touch them because they're so core to our idea. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Hi. Um, so I thought, what I thought really was really interesting about the entire de design process was kind of the logical train of thought of like, this affects this and this affects this. And it seems like, um, like it, almost, it, it, it almost takes like the suspension of belief. Uh, like like it, was, it seemed to be really difficult to balance the point in which uh, you can, you should, stop the logic kind of aspect and then start uh, adding like a ridiculous element to your game. So what, what point would you say did you start thinking, oh, it's kind of like? Um, well, that's kind of hard to say, Beggy. You, you might be over-rationalizing things in certain cases where, where you stick too much to your established design process and philosophies and then you end up with something, Beggy, that's missing something. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of cases, Beggy, it's also gut instinct, Beggy. You, you have your sort of professional experience and your gut instinct and your own tastes and preferences, Beggy, that you can fall back on. But of course, Beggy, those aren't not necessarily shared by the entire team. So it, you then go into a process that's much more about sort of convincing each other instead of making sticking to the process. It's, it's difficult to say maybe when exactly that needs to happen or if there's a point where that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Hi. Uh, first, just this is one of my favorite games. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for bringing it to us and thank you for this presentation. Um, my question is, uh, I'm curious as to once you arrived at the the, the function and the design of these, these machines, how did you work their purpose, the, their narrative purpose into the story? How did that affect their design? How did that interact? So it's, it's something, Maggie, that we always push, Maggie, so make sure, Maggie, that they have a function in their ecology. Mm -hmm. uh, but in some cases, Maggie, it's really hard to balance that, Maggie, with the design, Maggie, the, the combat design requirements. So it's something, Maggie, that we want to do, but it doesn't always match. So in a couple of cases, Maggie, so like, well, you know, it, it plays really well. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but it plays really well. So let's do it anyway. It's, it's, you, you shouldn't, Maggie, stick too sort of idealistic to the idea that it all has to make sense. Mm. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you again for the talk. It was very informative. Um, I was wondering, with all the creature designs, there's so much love and there's so much thought into all of them. And with the rush of AAA production, I was wondering if processes like outsourcing helped the core team just focus and really bring out the best in those ideas, or how did that help with the core team? Uh, so yeah, we, we do quite a lot of outsourcing. Okay. Um, most of our cinematics are outsourced. Okay. Almost all of our modeling and texturing is outsourced. Okay. Uh, so it, it, it is basically, what we tend to do is basically just stick to what we feel is our core business, which is sort of designing games and developing games, but not necessarily making art assets. So there is an aspect there, basically, that by outsourcing basically certain aspects, we can stay focused more. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, one more question, I just noticed. Is it one more question? Okay, one more question. Yeah, um, actually, my question was sort of related. Um, I was wondering about the scope of the creatures, because obviously uh, this game is also your first attempt at the open world, so there was quite a lot of problems to figure out there on this side as well. Um, 
there is so many creatures in the game, and they're all kind of different. Um, I wanted to know about how did you decide and when with design, obviously, because they probably required some stuff from you guys as well. Like, how did it work? Like, did they give you a list of types of enemies? Or like, how did you guys solve that? And then, obviously, how did you scope that? Because it's ridiculous, like, the amount of stuff. So. Very good question. Uh, Eric, our lead designer, maybe we'll be having a whole talk about that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's difficult. Maybe these things are very expensive. They took, take a lot of time to work, or to make. The Thunder Jaw in itself was an 18-month process, maybe from concept, maybe to full delivery. Uh, at some point, maybe you get all the ingredients together and then it becomes really easy to make things. Maybe once you've got all your mechanics there, once your design structure is there, it becomes a lot easier. But initially, in the initial phases, it's, it's very murderous maybe, to go through those processes. Yeah, it was like that, that demo that you showed there. It was, it was very interesting because it's, I think, very rare to see that in, in E3 demos or whatnot, that the scope of the demo is much more on the character and the tech and the animation and the systems than the usual environment art, like the, the actual environment is not that big. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So thanks everybody, uh, hope you enjoyed it.